I'm just gonna ask the Fred, you're over here by yourself. Just, just, yeah, you push the day. Where's the heat? I figure we just kind of hover around. Okay. And then just do the share screen. We can scroll a bit more. That's the audience. Oh no, I need to, I need to All good. I guess yeah. All right. Hi everybody. We are the Water Consultants, and today we're going to be presenting to you on the um, diversion structure design for the reconstruction of the bridge on the Pelkey Road over the Silver River um, and hydrologic analysis of that watershed. Our client is the Berga County Road Commission. My name is Fred Jones. My name is Max Sanmore. I'm Elijah Young. And then today we're also going to be speaking on behalf of Leah. Unfortunately, she's lost her voice, so we'll be doing our best for her. Um, on this first slide here on the left there, you'll see our temporary uh, diversion structure design plans, and we're going to be walking you through how we got to that point today. Um, yeah, so in our project, we have uh, our implementation, we have the project backgrounds, existing conditions, temporary conditions, uh, permanent conditions, and some questions at the end. Our group name is the Water Consultants, and we are responsible for design of a diversion structure moving the Silver River around Pelkey Road so that the bridge going over the Silver River can be uh, removed and replaced. Part of our project is also going to be looking at ways to mitigate the environmental uh, damage that might be done for the construction as for people. Uh, the bridge is pretty old, it was built in the 1950s. And part of our project was finding the design flow rates for this area because we requested uh, design and flow rates from Eagle for two separate watersheds, one within the other, and they returned the same flow rate for each watershed, which is very unlikely. And so we conducted a regression analysis and a HMS analysis to find the more accurate design flow rates for uh, the bridge. And so the full scope of our project is finding the design your flow rates for these for that for the bridge and also working on the uh, and the design of the diverse structure. And this is our final project, like Brett said. You can see the diversion structure going north of the current bridge, and that's what we can offer. So one of the first steps. Uh, was to do a NRCS soil analysis completed through the USDA Web Soil Survey. Uh, we did this by importing a watershed shape file for the Silver River into ArcGIS and then looking at the different soil types from there. Uh, the most common soil types being loggerhead loam, Nunica silt loam, and Oobly sturgeon frequently flooded complex. Uh, these are important for both, of, uh, both our regression and for site conditions during construction. Next step was to delineate the two relevant watersheds, uh, one of the Silver River with Pine Creek included into it, and then one without Pine Creek. So having an outlet just upstream of Pine Creek. The one on the left is excluding Pine Creek and the one on the right is with it. So you can see when you add Pine Creek into that watershed, it's quite a bit larger. Here's just an image of those outlets uh, in ArcGIS. So the one on the left, you can see is just upstream of Pine Creek and the one on the right is including it. And then those blue and yellow lines are flow accumulation lines in ArcGIS. So uh, the blue one is the Silver River and the yellow one is Pine Creek. This next image is of the impervious surfaces within those two watersheds. Um, you can see the white Dots are what we would consider impervious surfaces, so roads and structures mostly. 
Um, the watershed that does include Pine Creek has a little bit more impervious surface density in that region of the watershed. Then we move on to some of the other land cover. Here is the tree cover in the two watersheds. Since that region that has Pine Creek is a little bit more developed, like you saw in the previous slide, there's a little bit less density of tree cover in that region of the watershed as opposed to without Pine Creek in it. And then here is the difference in uh, surface water coverage in the two watersheds. So a um, little lower density of water cover in the area of Pine Creek as well. Then here's just a look at the main channel, the uh, Silver River. Um, for reference, that will be important later, the length and properties of that main channel for regression. Uh, so here are the two watersheds characteristics thrown into a table after all that work in ArcGIS for comparison. Uh, the biggest differences that we saw were the square mileage of the two watersheds. So when you do include Pine Creek, it's about eight square miles larger, which is a pretty significant portion. Um, and then small differences, like I said, percent area of trees and impervious surface. And so using the data that Fred gave me, uh, I ended up using the watershed without uh, Pine Creek included because the flow from Pine Creek doesn't go into the bridge. So uh, use the smaller one. The first method for regression that I used was the Michigan method. Uh, it's come up in 1993. It took into account a lot of things, such as the 100 year, 24 hour flow rate, the watershed area, the soil type, 5%, and things like that. Uh, these equations for the Michigan method are specific to the UP. And uh, because the Michigan method was written in 1993, I also used two methods from Wisconsin uh, that were written in 2020. Uh, even though they are meant for Wisconsin, they also cover the whole northern. Lakes and forests, eco region, which does include the whole of the upper peninsula. Uh, they use a lot less variables in them. Um, the, one of the methods, the area one method, looks at the watershed area, the main channel slope, and the percent of land use classified as forest. And then the area two method uses the watershed area and the land use classified as one. Additionally, we want to do a HEC HMS analysis for the watershed to get more flow rates for comparison. Um, and since we decided to do the watershed without Pine Creek in it, we went ahead and found some of the other characteristics that I need to input into HEC HMS. So the big one being the runoff curve number, uh, which is what would help us get the initial abstraction and basin lag time. Uh, and then other stuff that I got in ArcGIS would be the average watershed slope um, and then the main channel slope. Um, and then additionally, we did use a time interval of 15 minutes in HEC HMS. And so plotting together the flow rates that Eagle gave us, Fred's HEC HMS analysis and my pre regression analysis, is, uh, we can see that the Michigan method, the Wisconsin Area 2 method, and uh, uh, HEC HMS method all line up pretty well with each other. And then the uh, Eagle flow rates in the Wisconsin Area 1 are a little bit outliers. Because it's a temporary structure, uh, we're going to use a 10 year flow rate for our design because that's the standard. And because our highest 10 year flow rate was the Eagle values, that's the one that we ended up using for our design. Uh, so we had to use a conservative value. Uh, we have the water for the wetlands in the area. The two one, the two wetlands in the specific here that, that we're working in is R5 EPH and the PFO4 slash SS1C. Uh, the R5 UBH means that it is a wetland in a channel that is constantly flooded, so basically a river. And then the other one is a seasonally freshwater flooded wetland that is mostly tree constructed. Oh uh, yeah, so once the project is complete, uh, we'll have to, okay. Oh, there is, sorry, not right. Uh, We'll have to reseed the uh, disturbed uh, wetland area. Um, so there are certain nat uh, natural wetland plants, and they have them on a the list here. Uh, and this helps us determine which plants are acceptable for reseeding in the wetlands. Uh, our project is north, central, northeast region here, as you can see on the map. Uh, we're using the 2018 list because the 2020 list is still under review.
this is a quick uh, little example of what that list looks like. Um, you can see the codes here for which region it's in, the species name. One last thing is we did look into um, completing a distributed rainfall runoff model to acquire some more flow rates. Um, and this just works by evaluating a rainfall grid over a geographical model instead of looking at the watershed and storm as a whole. Um, we ultimately determined this would be too time consuming to complete uh, and also it'd be difficult to acquire a design storm for this. So we did not go through with it, but we did look into some software packages that would be useful for future reference. The first being HECRAS 2D by the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, it's supposed to be super user friendly. And then also XPS WMM by XPS Solutions is supposed to be a great option as well. Then here's a look at our existing site condition. So as is right now, the black box that you see is the existing bridge that needs to be reconstructed that we need to divert water around. And then the green area that you see are the protected wetlands that Elijah was talking about that we need to take into consideration during our mitigation plan later on. Now we're gonna talk into uh, a bit about our temporary construction condition. So when the bridge is being reconstructed, reconstructed, this is what we plan on having up for that reconstruction process. Uh, one of the things that needs to be done is a soil survey of the immediate construction area. Uh, hydric soils are soils that are saturated with water in the long term before construction. A survey should be conducted to establish soil types, uh, including A for all soils, S for sandy soils, F for bony and clay soils. Uh, this soil survey will be used. For the soil erosion and sedimentation control or SESC permit, it'll be submitted to the Barrick County Enforcing Committee. And this permit will include things such as a site plan, mediation plan, and the uh, existing water source for the area, including other things. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so to solve to, to create the channel to figure out how much we had to excavate, uh, we need to solve uh, using the equation. Uh, the magnetic equation is just you know a general hydraulic equation um, that we learn in uh, classes. <laughs> so uh, you can see Q here is the given flow rate. Uh, that's 1600 uh, CFS. And they got that from the Eagle 10 year storm. Uh, we, we chose the Eagle 10 year storm because that's pretty standard for hydraulic modeling for temporary urban structures. Uh, so we, and we use the, the Eagle specific value because we said, well, you know. The other values are a little bit lower, so we'll just find you know worst case scenario. So that's what we did. Um, that's what we used. Uh, some of these other values we just got, like you know, like the, the, like the width of the channel and, and the slope and stuff and the sides. We just got from like you know looking at the pre-existing channel that's already there and said, all right, you know, let's make something similar. So you know, we'll kind of emulate that natural. Um, oh yeah, so we we also had a depth of the channel. We ended up solving that for a but was a five point eight feet. Um, okay, so yeah, so the entire channel is lined in geotextile fabric, uh, which is pretty much just it's a, a permeable, fa permeable fabric. So like only water can move through it and it keeps the um, any soils from eroding and uh, going through this, this fabric. Um, so on top of that, we're going to be putting riprap and this is going to be again lying the whole channel length. Uh, the riprap will uh, slow the water down to a, a safe, safer speed. And it will also kind of, uh, you know, for very important conditions that keep from, you know, getting too out of control, which is like we just have a straight line channel. Uh, yeah, so we, I just determined that the size of that, like the average diameter is pretty all at one foot. Yeah, so to figure out uh, for our color, uh, we use HUI8, which is a uh, color modeling software. Um, we put all, you know, our design criteria into the software and it's, you know, it can calculate, you know, the best solutions for, best solution for your, uh, yeah, your, your, your design inputs. Um, so our, our, our design uses uh, corrugated high density polyethylene, or H, HDPE, um, which is plastic. Um, we use six barrels, so six different culverts. They're about 70 feet long, they're six foot diameter, 
And we chose the, the HTTP because it is lightweight, easy to use, and it's pretty cheap for, for you know, for cars. Um, yeah, so. Right, so this is just kind of like a uh, profile view of the of the car uh, like looking at the side. You can see the road at the very top. You can actually see the water moving through the, the culvert itself. That's the blue lines. So you know you can see the watershed elevation leading into the culvert, and you know the very peak flow, and then as it's and it's leading as it's leading. Um, and these are salvation data. So your area. This is just looking at it from like the inlet view, like if you're standing in the channel itself. Um, uh, so the water be going, you know, from behind you through these. Um, um, anyways, so that's that's what that looks like. You must see the roadway surface at the top there. So this is the plan drawings for those temporary conditions. So everything drawn out that Matthew and Elijah would have just talked about. The blue boxes that you see with the crosshatch pattern on it are going to be our trapezoidal channels. Um, so those come out to be about 54 feet wide up top, depending on the surface elevation. And that's all going to be lined with that geotextile fabric and the riprap that he was talking about that comes up to be about 960 square yards of that. Then that blue, dark blue box that you see underneath the road is going to be our culvert path. So that's a 70 foot long culvert path with 35 feet on either side of the road center line. And that's the three seven foot diameter culverts of the corrugated plastic. That will be covered by a temporary gravel road so equipment can get in and out of sight when needed. And then lastly, the Silver River channel will be lined with 500 linear feet of straw, wattles, and sill fence for erosion control. And then lastly, we'll talk about some of our permanent site conditions. So everything uh, after the cleanup and the bridge reconstruction, how everything's gonna look. Uh, right here is our uh, permanent condition site plan drawn up. So the areas that you see in blue are the areas that we impact protected wetlands. So we have to account for that after construction with some mitigation and that area off to the left, the crosshatch pattern that you see is set aside for mitigation later on. And then the other crosshatch pattern that you see up to the north where the channel and culvert ones were, we do have to reseed everything that was disturbed. And it's worth mentioning that most of this is outside of the 60 foot right away that MDOT does have. So we do have to acquire an easement for a lot of this work. Here's a look at our estimate. Our estimates were put together using MDOT 2021 unit bid averages for uh, the superior region or MDOT region one. Uh, some of the biggest costs that we're gonna see are the excavation of the channel itself, which takes into account everything associated with the channel excavation, including diverting water into the new channel from the Silver River. Uh, next big one is gonna be riprap, which because the channel is so large, we just require such a vast amount of riprap. That comes out to be about over $31,000. Uh, the biggest portion of this project is the culvert installation itself. Uh, since there's 210 linear feet or 370 foot long barrels of class B culvert, which is that corrugated plastic that Matthew was talking about, that comes out to about 92 grand. And then lastly, the roadside seating, since there's so much area disturbed from our channel and our culvert, uh, that will come out to be 26 grand of it as well. Um, as a rough guideline from MDOT, we used a mobilization cost of about 10% of the total cost of the project. We used 1.25% for inflation for the year of 2020 and 2.26% for the year of 2021, as well as a contingency rate of 15%, coming out to a grand total of about 274,000. And finally, here's our final schedule. Uh, the critical path is in green and any Things that need to be done at any full time are blue that mostly applies to the soil erosion prevention tasks. Uh, you can see that the schedule does jump from April to October, and that's because in the middle of our project, they have to demolish and replace a bridge. And so we chose the beginning of April to the end of October because that's uh, pretty much the window for construction in this area, making sure that we're not getting too far into 
uh, the winter months where the weather is warm, the less you've been working. Uh, yeah, so uh, like I said, we used a, a 10 year before we started. I uh, that was a standard. Um, so, yeah, so we uh, have the three uh, HDPD culverts to set up with that are um, 70 feet long. That's just a quick example of a few of our, our projects that look like one that's you know, that worked on the bridge. So, uh, thank you. Any questions? This one? Yeah, I was curious if you like design this point bolt that would fit for the bridge. Where's the top of the folder? Oh, uh, so where that blue line is kind of here and then it turns to the black line because it's like that blue line kind of curved down, that's the top of the folder. Kind of so how so HY8 works is so you pretty much just you put in a bunch of design flow rates and you kind of your design criteria. So we actually like pick the number that we want for like the diameter, how many culverts, flow material, that stuff, and like kind of like some channels, uh, input data, like the roadway data. And then so it, what it does is it then you can put like a range of flow rate data, and then we'll run a bunch of scenarios for each, like you know, maybe every 200, you know, CFS or whatever, depending on how what the values are gonna be. It'll run a, a model and then it'll determine, you know, at what it'll determine for you at what flow rate will it actually. They overtop the roadway and so you're actually flooding the roadway. And so you can kind of see step by step how much water flows through the culvert, like up on how much flow rate flows through the culvert. Or and if you know it does overtop, you know, what uh, uh what uh, flow rate that's gonna be at. And it'll actually also tell you much other data, like you know, how much water is going over the culvert or, or over the roadway, how much is going to the culvert, you know, slight emissions, a bunch of other data. Yeah. Because the, the um, I mean, it's the actual river, right? So it's a beach. So it's kind of providing for the for the temporary. Otherwise, it's not available for the temporary. So you have 1600 feet of design for 1600 CFS coming out of the river. How does it make this left turn into the diverse channel? Yeah, so it would just basically be an earthen dam built up. And that's kind of discussed like in the unit bid for MDOT. Um, I guess we never really specifically addressed it. But yeah, it's just built up earth that would push it in. Yeah, it'd be good to line again with Geotech South Africa for Brown. So it's uh, starting to grow into that. So it'd be like actually build a compacted earthen dam in the channel and have to refract. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's actually gonna be like a 90 degree turn, but it's it's a little more gentle than that. But yeah. Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> I think it would maybe make it a really huge like divergent path to if like maybe even longer than what we have. It would probably yeah. have a cost. <laughs> Yeah. It is lower elevation, yeah. So there's a huge hump right up the road, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Do I have to do anything? Um, stop the recording. Oh.